It took nearly a century and many uprisings before the island of Crete could join the Greek mainland, free from Ottoman rule. But even before gaining its independence, its soil had been planted with the seeds of a different struggle, one that would claim not bodies but minds. It was fueled by the discoveries of an English archaeologist who turned into history what had only existed as legend, a highly developed civilization pre-existing classical Greece by a thousand years, centered on the island of Crete, part of a complex of cultures that were ruled not by kings, but queens. His name was Sir Arthur Evans, and during the summer of 1900, he and his team unearthed in Crete a lost world, one that looked so radically different from that of ancient Greece that Evans believed he had reached the core of the prehistoric matriarchies that had been theorized for decades. He named his new discovery Minoan Civilization and began to write extensively about the texture of life that he believed had once flourished in Crete, a life where slim, wasted youth played freely in nature overseen by the invisible presence of a great mother goddess, inspiring them with love rather than war. His vision would later be challenged, with some believing that Evans had in fact invented much of the culture he claimed to have discovered. But despite their criticism, Minot and Crete went on, exerting its magnetic pull of feminine mystique on the wandering minds of poets and scholars alike, becoming something of a holy grail claimed by nationalists and pacifists, psychonauts and radical feminists. Only that, unbeknownst to these sailors of the mind, the secrets of ancient Crete could be far darker than anything they could have ever imagined. Evans did not arrive in Crete an empty slate. He was preceded by a number of authors learned in classical history who from the middle of the 19th century had theorized about the existence of a primitive matriarchy, a rule of women preceding that of men by thousands of years, placing first the foundations for human civilization. They named their speculative culture Mother Right and special importance was placed on the island of Crete as a potential host. Even centuries before them, ancient historian Herodotus had described how the original inhabitants of Crete took their names from their mothers rather than fathers, testifying to at least a matrilinear, if not outright matriarchal culture. These clues should not have supported a theory with scientific pretensions, but at the turn of the 19th century one had reasons enough to believe in them, as only a few decades before, German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann had discovered in Turkey the site of an ancient fortress, which he believed was the original site of Ilion the mythical castle of Troy that inspired Homer's first epic, the Iliad. Until then, the Trojan War was considered to have existed only in the poet's imagination. But Schliemann showed that one could follow mythical clues to make actual scientific discoveries. Moreover, the culture that he uncovered appeared compatible with the one described by Homer, a world of aristocratic warriors fighting for personal glory. Back in his home country of Germany, Schliemann's discoveries were hailed as evidence of a proto-Aryan culture, and his descriptions of blonde warriors began to attract the interests of those nationalists who were in search for a viable alternative to the pacifist ethos of Christianity. And during his excavations, Schliemann discovered just that, an ancient symbol, the swastika, that he later used to decorate the entire entrance of his new villa, still standing today with its ornamented gates in the center of Athens. Naturally, 
In this polarized climate, theories about the existence of an ancient matriarchy had become a hot topic and were used even by Friedrich Engels, one of the two principal founders of communism, who around the same time wrote that the overthrow of mother right was the historical defeat of the female sex. Woman was degraded and reduced into servitude. A servitude, of course, that Marxism would overthrow once it came to power. But while Schliemann's theories about a prehistoric patriarchy, the warrior culture, as had been described by Homer, was proven to be correct, nothing by way of a prehistoric matriarchy was, as of yet, backed by any evidence. And so, as the last Turkish troops were departing from a liberated Crete, Destiny would leave the task to an English archaeologist, Arthur Evans, who first managed to obtain the necessary permits by the newly established government and began digging. When on the summer of 1900, Evans hit upon the ruins of a palace that belonged, much like Schliemann's Troy, to the Greek Bronze Age, a thousand years before the Parthenon was built, the fragments he found from the palace walls appear to have depicted a dancing group of young men and women playing half-naked in nature, and Evans commissioned a project of restoration so radical it would later cast doubts on his scientific credentials. But his most important discovery by way of proving the existence of an archaic matriarchy were the two female idols that he found lying in the palatial ruins. Idols representing a priestess or goddess perhaps, with bare breasts holding a snake in each hand. The image exerted a chthonic sexuality that stood in sharp contrast to the warrior virgins worshipped by the Greeks, and Evans became convinced that he had reached the locus of a mother right type culture. He named his discovery Minoan Civilization, a name that would since describe the Cretan Bronze Age. Finding no weapons, Evans theorized that these Minoans were peaceful. Their dominance achieved not through violence but commerce, together with a complex of peace treaties. A Pax Minoica that ruled the Mediterranean as far as the Iberian Peninsula, modern-day Spain, but how much of this was historically true? Seeing the original fragments next to the bold restorations is enough to raise at least one eyebrow. Will Evans' insistence on the peaceful character of the Minoans, who appear to have forged an empire without as much as a bloody nose, was hard to believe. Luckily for him, none of these criticisms were ushered during his lifetime, and Evans died seeing his vision of the Minoans becoming the dominant narrative, inspiring an entire generation of artists with hopes for a pacifist society, one that would soon become desperately needed as Europe was plunged into destructive world wars. One of these artists embracing Evans' vision of Crete, and the most devoted perhaps, was British poet Robert Graves, who published the manifesto in 1937, writing how history proper begins everywhere with the suppression of matriarchal culture by patriarchy. And after the war ended, an emotionally broken Graves published a science fiction novel as an attempt to restoration. He called it Seven Days in New Crete and was set in a future where the collapse of Christian Europe brought a revival of Minoan religion. Throughout his story, Grave presents his new Cretans as extremely good-looking and indecently happy. Poets are their legislators and women are regarded as the superior sex, acting directly on behalf of a great goddess. But then, the novel takes a turn, as the narrator, himself a visitor in New Crete, realizes that for all their beauty, the men of this culture are lacking in a certain something that we in the real world call character, that is always built by struggle, that is totally absent from this New Cretan paradise. 
more surprisingly and somewhat funny is that during his entire stay the narrator hears no jokes. Finally we're let in the Cretan secret, a secret that some anthropologists believe to have been a historical fact, human sacrifice. And here comes the punchline, because for all the criticism that he received over the years, Evans could have actually been right all along. Maybe the Minoans did find a way to avoid war, only that this might have involved the redirection rather than suppression of our instinct towards violence. In recent years, and only a hundred meters away from Evans Palace, archaeologists found a mass of children's bones that bore marks of deliberate knife cuts, like parts of their skin was ritually removed after they died. A dark finale indeed, but should we really be surprised? After all, the Greeks of classical antiquity had, centuries before Europeans first theorized their mother right concept, painted the island of Crete in legend as a dark world of feminine mystique, where a subterranean monster, the Minotaur, half bull and half man, was fed on the flesh of young men who came as slaves from the state subordinate to Crete. When Evans first made his discoveries, he was fueled by passion for a radical alternative to the warrior culture that had ruled Europe from Homer to the nationalist movements of his time. And so, commenting on this myth, he wrote how the monster's lair turned out to be a peaceful abode of priest kings. Others rushed to prove him wrong, but maybe, and more dangerously, he was half right and maybe there is also a way to violence that is feminine.